that's it. Yep. Yep. Session is being recorded. Hey, greetings and salutations. It the time is um, eleven thirty one uh, a.m. and it's the twelfth uh, of August, twenty twenty, and uh, this is um, the Business Ethics for a Digital Society, uh, the drop in discussion session. You know, uh, my name is Dr. John Lenarchi, and my co-conspirator is uh, Mr. Lowercase. Ilya Anadiev. Um and remember, this is a discussion. It's not a lecture or a seminar. Um, and uh, everyone is most welcome to actually contribute. You know, so you can actually uh, talk live and see if you can actually, uh, you know, destroy both of our internets because sometimes <laughs> our connections are very tenuous. So, uh, but if you don't want to actually talk, you're most welcome to just um, uh, make a a text comment in the corner and we'll try to respond and I think uh, Ilya's showing something interesting from the news here um, and what uh, I wanted to actually just say before we talk about Ilya's news item is that today I want to actually talk about um, assignment one I think uh, because uh, it's probably due in a few weeks time I think um, first week in September something like that you know uh, and, uh, and, and I think it's after the uh, mid-semester break, you know, which is kind of ironic that we have a break since we're actually in stage four lockdown. So it's, it's kind of like, where are we going to go, I guess? Um, but, uh, uh, oh, Ilya, did you get those uh, multiple choice? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I want to experiment with something today, you know, rather than me just kind of repeating the same thing. Uh, we'll use the uh, facilities of Collaborate Ultra um, and put up a few uh, quiz questions, you know, and see what the uh, audience um, votes for, and then I'll tell you what the right answer is. And I think most of those uh, quizzes are really dead simple. Don't you think, Ilya? I mean, like, uh, uh, yes, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. You'll, you'll have to tell me uh, when when you want them, because they'll take a couple of minutes to set up. Each. Sure, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So maybe... Uh, uh, we'll talk first about your news item, and then maybe I'll uh, pull up the uh, assignment one uh, specification, and then while I'm doing that, you can set up uh, the first question, I think. But let's talk about your news item first. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, well, <clears throat> it was interesting because um, it just flooded the uh, Twitter, and uh, um, on my account anyway, uh, about this uh, policeman, and they said, oh, how dreadful this policeman is choking this girl. And I thought, um, well, uh, once again, the, the populace just jumps onto one side of the story. Uh, but when when you actually look at the video and then you see other videos or <coughs> other videos and um, other uh, sides of the story, you actually see that, that this young girl that was basically wrestled to the ground and so forth, um, she, uh, she wasn't wearing a mask. Right? And uh, when they, when they, or when the policeman put her on the ground, she, he actually did it because she, she was kicking and swinging and everything else that you could think of under the sun. Uh, but she supposedly walked into a shop without the mask. And here's, here's the clincher: she supposedly has a medical exemption. But, um, but she, she seemed to flaunt the fact that she didn't have to wear it. And um, when the police came along um, to say, you know, like your mask, she gave them the finger. <laughs> it actually didn't say anything about the medical uh, certificate. And her boyfriend was there just uh, videoing it and doing the Black Lives Matter thing. Oh, I can't breathe, she's choking and all this sort of rubbish. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and when, when you see the policeman actually clearly, he's not actually choking it, he's holding her, um, you know, hoodie on either sides of a of a um, of a neck, just mm -hmm. to be able to control her, right? Mm -hmm. And she's she's there, you know, profanities and a lot, right? And the more and more you watch it, I've, I've now I've watched this video probably about five or six times. Um, yeah, yeah. It just it I just um, tend to think, bloody hell, you know, the parents really stuffed up. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Are like, you kids, your kids listening? No, sorry. 
Yeah, but my kids are the ones who actually said, yeah, like, how, like, they, they were actually saying, like, there is absolutely no respect for, for the policeman. There's absolutely no respect for the people that were in the shop and so forth. There's, there's no, like, it's just this, um, you know, I can do anything sort of mentality. And now, right at the end, we just received an email uh, from someone who uh, knows about this case. Yeah. And they said uh, she's basically, um, she was outside of the five kilometre um, radius as well. Right? Yeah. So she's, she's not, she's just breaking law after law after law. And, um, and I don't know why, but it seems like this social justice sort of stuff is, right. uh, you know, the emotional stuff. Sure. Just I'm seems typing, to say, oh, how dare he do that, right? I, I'm um, typing in a word. I'm typing in a word into the yeah. uh, uh, chat section, and uh, and I think it describes um, the gist of what you're trying to say. And, yeah, uh, but I, I just can't. In title. Yeah, oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, oh, because yes. because I think uh, entitlement is oh. is is almost like a modern vice. You know how uh, in this course we yeah. talk about. Uh, virtue ethics, and um, yeah. there's actually a long list of virtues uh, which you can find in uh, the week two and three learning materials section, um, and uh, it, it's got a shorter list of vices. So, um, virtues are good things, vices are bad things, right? And I think entitlement is actually a kind of new bad characteristic, you know. So, um, but from your describing, um, this person has no respect, but they also no. feel entitled to not wear a mask. You know, they have that kind of sense of entitlement. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the interesting question is more like why? Why do they act this way? I mean, is it just entitlement, or if they have no respect, why don't they have respect? You know, why? Why is it that you know um, they kind of wreak this angst on police officers? You know, aren't police officers supposed to be uh, symbols of um, you know moral order within a society? Like, if you see a, a police officer, isn't that supposed to be a symbol that there's some good force out there? So true. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But but, um, but not only, not only that is um, uh, <clears throat> they they, the the point being there was that they 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 seem to assume that the policeman was attacking her, but he's actually he's actually protecting the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and he was not told that she has a medical exemption. Uh, she just gave him the middle finger. Right? Um, so, like, as far as he's concerned, he's doing his duty to protect us all. <laughs> Uh, it just just to, just to add to it, uh, last yeah. night um, my wife um, was was on the uh, chat stuff, the Facebook stuff, and uh, she actually put up a comment saying the same sort of thing. It's like entitlement, you know, like she's probably never been told no, right? Um, you know, the you can be anything you you want to be in life. It's bullshit, right? But uh, it seems to be ingrained in these guys. And um, and this guy uh, responded to her comment. Mm -hmm. With get get this um yeah get this this is an all time yeah. classic uh, he said f off you conservative prick sort of thing <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it just you, you can't have a say you can't have your you know like um, you can't say anything right, unless it yeah. agrees with some leftist um, me mentality. It's just unbelievable. You, you, you cannot have any voice at all. And uh, just just to go through that is, um, I, I wanted her to just keep bouncing, just just to basically troll this guy uh, yeah. to see whether uh, this would actually come true. Uh, I'm not sure yeah. whether you're familiar with it. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and, uh, and I, I've actually experimented a few times uh, when I've bounced bounced across um, comments on like uh, not Facebook because I got rid of Facebook it's rubbish, um, but I, on the Twitter and uh, bouncing comments back and forth. Eventually, that person loses it, um, and I've actually found I, I don't know uh, why, but it's usually a, a leftist Marxist guy which will lose it much quicker than someone who's from a conservative Republican sort of um, area. Yeah. And uh, they lose it to a point they just say, uh, you're a Nazi. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Godwin's law actually says um, 
uh, God won't actually come up with a theory. And uh, it's kind of proven in a way. Uh, if you go uh, go through an argument long enough, someone will just say that you're a Nazi. Yeah? So yeah. God knows law. <laughs> the and, is that- and they'll refer to you as, as, as a Hitler and all this sort of rubbish. Well, that, that's, that's what they call. Uh, let me let me put that up. Ad hominem arguments. In terms, uh, I'm putting it up. Ad hominem arguments, right? Are when you actually attack the person. It's like name calling. You know, yes, like, yes. Uh, for Personal example, attack. like uh, yeah. Andrew Bolt, for example, right? Um, yeah. He's a kind of right wing commentator in, in Australia. Yeah. And uh, and often it's almost like they attack him personally, and literally they did attack him personally. <laughs> some director and they beat him up, right? Yeah. So, so it's more like I think even he would like to have people just argue with him based on his arguments rather than attacking yeah. him, you know. Um, yeah. and, and I think ad hominem attacks are kind of the uh, lazy way of attacking people. It's just, you know, it's like you know, you're too tall, you're too short, you know. Yeah. So that's why you know you're invalid. You know, in terms of you know what you are saying, um, but but I think the other thing I wanted to put up is because uh, you were mentioning left leftists, and maybe there are some people that are listening to us that don't know what left means. Uh, that it's not the opposite of right, as in right-handed and left-handed. So I wanted to put up a, a definition of what left is that I found. Left equals relating to uh, a person or a group. Fav- oh, sorry. Uh, left equals relating to a person or group favoring radical, reforming, or socialist views. Yes. And, and if you're from the right, uh, it means that you're more conservative. You know, so um, I guess uh, tradition, resistant to change, etc., that kind of thing. You know, yeah. you'd be a, a, a person who's from the right wing. So, uh, and and I think often uh, in in life, it's almost like a metaphor. Uh, for you know, uh, you know the kind of ethical right versus wrong, you know, uh, because you know if you're on the left, then you will think that somebody that's on the conservative right is wrong, and, and vice versa, you know. What I mean? So it's and then most people would kind of dismiss that and say that's politics, that's not ethics. But I think um, it's all kind of it, it's all mixed together. I think you know in, in life today, you know you can't kind of say oh there's a difference between manners and ethics. And politics, yes, there is probably in the kind of academic sense, but in reality, it's all mixed together. You know, if people have uh, bad manners, then sometimes people say, you know, you're kind of a uh, wrong in individual. You know, in, in some way, you're kind of bad. You know, yeah. uh, and, and also if you're on the wrong side of politics, right, then you can be deemed to be bad. For that you know? um, so yeah. But it's interesting in in getting into an argument with someone who is from the left, they, um, and and being being born and brought up in a communist country, and then fleeing the rubbish, right, and then yeah. going to another communist country and fleeing it from there. Um, to Australia, and, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah, we're starting to, yeah. <laughs> sorry, no. so, might have to leave this place too, but. Uh, but <laughs> Yeah, just just to get some freedom, but um, you can't actually uh, leave because they closed yeah. the borders. Remember, and you can't yeah. you can't go five kilometres away from your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, if you want to get away from socialism, you you do anything <laughs> to get away from. It. But, um, yeah, uh, I, think, I think what they should have is ankle bracelets. You know how they say people can't leave their house, right? Yeah, you can't go five kilometres away from your house. Why well, don't just have everybody having you know ankle bracelets, right? And then once yeah. you do leave, you know, five, you, 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 you walk past that five kilometer radius and all of a sudden your ankle bracelet starts beeping. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Holy crap, I better go back, right, before the police get me, right? <laughs> but but it's, it's interesting arguing yeah. with either yeah. side, right? So yeah. if you argue with a conservative, you argue with a lefty, um, you, you actually find uh, you argue with a, 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 a right wing guy. Uh, it's all about facts, numbers, and you know figures. Right? Yeah. But yeah. Uh, when when you argue with a leftist, um, you, it's all about emotion and you know um, how you feel and all this sort of rubbish. Right? Hey, so it, it, it kind of clouds any sort of like uh, pure logic. It's just emotion. Oh, wait a minute, Ilya. Let me be the devil's advocate here. 
Yep. Uh, yep. So, so that means, uh, according to what you're saying, Jesus Christ was a leftist. Uh, in in a way, yes, but he he did use logic by you know splitting the bread and so forth. It, it, he knew numbers needed something. But uh, it wasn't yeah, about it yeah, wasn't just that, about healing. So. But the kind of you know, but but the but the kind of miracle thing was maybe to appease the conservatives, right? So, <laughs> 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 it's like, yeah, just get, a, get a vote here and there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's more like, but, but but in essence, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesus was really uh, uh, socialist in a way. Yeah, because well, he yeah, would, yeah. He so would so yeah. See, but that's just it. I think that even it, ideologies, whatever people might have, right, are not necessarily uh, that bad as long as they don't become too extreme. I think the problem is when the people become extreme in their ideology, right? You know, like um, fanatical almost, right? I think if, if you're an extremist or uh, fanatical about something, then you kind of remove the ability to actually think about your belief system. Or think in your belief system. You know, it's like yeah. Socrates said. You know, uh, a life unexamined is not worth living. People have a responsibility to think, right? yeah. and, that, and that just doesn't mean kind of blindly accepting things. So, I yeah. think that you know, uh, 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 regardless of what your belief system, you know, um, a, a religious, atheist, whatever that kind of thing, mm -hmm. I think you kind of deepen your belief system if you actually think. You know, you, yeah, I mean, but, but, but the same point of view is. Um, uh, someone from the right will not care who you are, what you are, and as long as you do your thing without, you know, hurting anyone, right? So not not worried about it at all. But on the left side, it is um, it's pure control, of saying, um, uh, no, I don't agree with you, and they'll just suppress you and oppress you and oh, and, and, and now now and counter, freedom and all. Right? I will yeah. counter that. I mean, because uh, you say what well, from the leftist point of view is, uh, well, even if you do something that's not hurting somebody, a person from the left would say it's still wrong. That's because yeah, okay. uh, I think I don't like uh, what you're doing. Feeling. Yeah, yeah, but the leftist approach then, according to what you're saying, is actually more theoretical in a sense. It's actually kind of uh, thinking about overarching theories that would apply to the whole of society. I mean, there is actually a, a discipline, an academic discipline, uh, and I'm typing it in now, it's called sociology. Have you heard of sociology? <laughs> now, the thing is, uh, there, there is also a discipline still called, uh, and I'm typing it in now, uh, ant anthropology, right? So. Yeah. If you try and actually uh, get the definitions of both, they're kind of very similar. Right? And in fact, a lot of people will often say, uh, why does something like anthropology still exist, right? Because isn't anthropology supposed to be, you know, something that looks at kind of so-called primitive societies, right? And anyway, uh, the term primitive is now politically incorrect. You can't actually refer to anything, any society or group of people as being primitive, right? Because that's taking a... a privileged uh, position by saying, you know, somebody is less than you. But just because you don't understand uh, their customs, their history, etc., that kind of thing, because of difference, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and the thing is, uh, anthropology as a discipline had that problem, you know, because it was always, you know, like, uh, you know, like Indiana Jones, even though Indiana Jones from Raiders of the Lost Ark was a, an archaeologist, right? Uh, anthropologists uh, always had this kind of heroic image of, you know, going to through the jungle or whatever, and you know, studying people, you know, in, in kind of. Uh, I'm trying to resist using the term tribe, you know, because people say you can't use the word tribe anymore. I was at a conference recently. They said, "Don't use the word tribe. It's actually incorrect. Right? <laughs> ethnic group. Okay, so they're studying ethnic groups, for example, right? Um, and and their customs, languages, and so forth, right? Uh, but the thing is, um, now, you know, everything is kind of urbanized. You know, the influence of uh, information technology is so pervasive. There's probably no place on this planet that you can be where you don't have some kind of internet connection, even though it may be crappy. This is your place. Really? Uh, Moonbase Alpha? So. <laughs> so, uh, no, I always joke with Ilya that he, he actually uh, has his home uh, in, in a place called, well, it is Moon Base Alpha. It's, it's so remote, right, you know. Um, and, uh, and sometimes um, internet connectivity can be spotty. Uh, and we'll be talking about that 
in a few weeks uh, when we cover a topic called digital divide, which means that uh, some people in, in life have, uh, you know, fantastic connection to internet and all kinds of wonderful technologies that other people don't, you know. And, uh, and uh, the aim in life is to make sure that there's a kind of uh, equal level playing field in terms of access to technology. But going back to the difference between sociology and anthropology, uh, anthropology in a sense looks at kind of you know customs uh, behaviors you know all sorts of things in in groups of people in the small you know so uh, now anthropologists are kind of reinventing themselves as studying uh, small groups even within companies there's actually um, a, a sub-discipline of anthropology called corporate anthropology so a lot of anthropologists they may have gotten their PhDs, couldn't get a job somewhere, and they reinvent themselves as corporate anthropologists and offer, you know, consulting work to people. This was before the pandemic, of course, right? Uh, now, sociology is kind of the same thing. You're looking at p groups of people, but bigger groups of people. So uh, sociology deals with, I guess, um, you know, ideas which can be theorized or applied to the whole of society or societies, you know. So, uh, and, and I think... If you look at maybe the political leanings of sociologists, right, I would definitely say that a lot of uh, sociologists come from the left. You know, be kind of few and far between to find a, a right-wing sociologist. It's almost like you know, a contradiction. You know, uh, but maybe that would also apply to uh, anthropology as well, um, because uh, if if you uh, look at that stuff from um, the uh, Marcula Center for Applied Ethics. Um, uh, the uh, 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 institute that's actually at Santa Clara University in uh, the United States. And if you look this week in the um, uh, learning materials folder, there's, uh, there's a video, a short video, uh, and I think it's, the title is Five Ways to Be Good. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, uh, a short lecture delivered by, presentation delivered by Kirk O'Hanson, who who's the D the director of um, the uh, Makula Center for Applied Ethics, and I think one of the um, one of the ways to be good, according to Kirk Hansen, which we don't actually focus on a lot in this course, right? Uh, and, and I'll type it in. Uh, the uh, common good, and, and I think the common good uh, is is more uh, a sociological uh, kind of perspective, I think, on ethics. You know, what can you do in life that would kind of benefit the whole of society? So uh, I'm sure that if Ilya kind of scratched beneath the surface of the common good, he'd probably say, ooh, this sounds leftist. <laughs> I don't know. I Ilya, can you do a search for common good and see if there's a Wikipedia article for that? I mean, it could be kind of a newish, a newish thing. I mean, the thing about the common good, right, uh, that's interesting. I think it comes from. Uh, oh, there, yeah, common good. Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. No, the second one, I think. That's it. Yeah, yeah. In philosophy, can always oh, common good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Now, see that that I think is is see the philosophy, economics, and political science. So it, it covers the gamut of kind of disciplines, you know. Um, now, the other idea that you may have actually read, students that are still listening and not asleep, um, <laughs> is a social contract theory, you know, or contractarianism, right? And with social contract theory, uh, there are kind of, you know, two, uh, you know, thought leaders. Uh, uh, Thomas Hobbes was one, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau another. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a Swiss-French philosopher. Thomas Hobbes was British. And, and Thomas Hobbes wrote a book called Leviathan, uh, which is kind of impossible to read. And I think he, he came up with um, his, his, his notion of what a social contract is. And so did uh, John Jack Russo. In fact, Russo actually wrote a book uh, which was called Social Contract, but in French. Pardon, my French pronunciation is crap, so I'm not going to say what it, what, well, what it is in actual French. Um, but uh, uh, the, the difference between the two, so a social contract is basically like an implicit agreement within a society that people act in a certain way uh, so that, you know, uh, social benefits are distributed for everyone in a kind of equitable manner. Right? And uh, Hobbes kind of believed in this 
notion of social contract because he thought uh, most humans were born bad, born to be bad, like that song. <laughs> Um, and uh, and in order to stop people from kind of you know continuously being nasty to each other and, and not being able to have a stable society, then you had to have this thing called a social contract, an implicit agreement. People kind of work together to be nice for everybody's benefit. You know? And a kind of more institutionalized uh, form of social contract is that in most places on this planet where you live. Uh, there'll be, uh, you know, um, uh, a fire brigade and uh, uh, a police service and, uh, and and rubbish collection and all kinds of things. You know, all those are examples of social contract uh, or government contracts. They're kind of like enforced social contract, which come usually from the citizens who live there paying rates, you know, some kind of tax rates, etc. And it provides services for the benefit of everyone, you know. And another example of a social contract would be a public library system. Uh, and, and public library systems are really, I think, very special examples of a social contract, you know, because, okay, yes, uh, you know, uh, someone has to pay for it through rates, taxes, etc. But basically, libraries are free. You know, you go there, you can read a book, you can, you know, surf the internet, you can borrow a book, etc. And, 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 I don't think most people kind of appreciate how, how special this is and how uh, as a notion of kind of free libraries is being eroded because in a lot of cities, right, because of cost cutting measures are saying, well, we can't really afford something like libraries, you know, uh, we'll have to kind of, you know, uh, make them smaller or, you know, uh, minimize collections and stuff like that. But, but the thing about libraries is it, it, they've always been places where people can go to meet, to to gain knowledge, to study, to veg out, etc. You know, um, so, and 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 I think that in in this time in lockdown, one of the bad things, one of the really bad things, is all the libraries are closed. I mean, and and, and libraries were places where people could go, as I said before, to, to meet other people, to think about things, to surf the net, etc. And now that's cut off. You know? um, but yeah, social contracts, you know. Uh, oh yeah, uh, John Jack Russo, uh, because because Thomas Hobbes um, thought that people were born to be bad, but then you had to have this thing called a social contract to bring everybody into line. Uh, uh, and Russo thought the opposite. He thought that people in their natural state were were perfect, good, etc. You know, like the kind of uh, Catholic notion of you know original sin. They didn't have any original sin, you know, according to. Uh, uh, Rousseau, and what actually made people bad was civilization. So civilization was actually a bad thing, which meant that Rousseau's, uh, you know, philosophy is kind of uh, anarchistic, you know. Uh, and in fact, uh, the anarchist movement, people who don't believe in organized government, actually were inspired by the ideas of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, because Rousseau was a kind of weird dude, you know. I mean, like, uh, as a philosopher, he did a lot of things which were kind of not that good. I mean, you wouldn't want to use his life in ex as an example for how to live. Uh, but he had a lot of radical ideas. So very much, I think, uh, from mo a modern perspective, uh, Rousseau would be like a super lefty. In fact, um, one of the uh, books that he wrote uh, was actually a treatise on how to educate children. And he thought that one of the problems with educating children was that they didn't have enough say in what they were taught and, and, and Rousseau argued basically that you should essentially let the kids make up their minds to what they want to learn or what they want to do, you know, like run wild and run free, which I probably didn't go down too well you know, back then, it was you know, 200 or so years ago, you know, um, where people had certain strict opinions and also a lot of people didn't have the opportunity of sending their kids to school because uh, they were living in poverty, extreme poverty. So, uh, but, uh, but Rousseau's ideas, right, uh, often get a, you know, a dusting down, uh, resurrected, e even in the 21st century, because uh, they're really kind of radical. Think, yeah. But both of these people, Thomas Hobbes and, uh, and John Jacques Rousseau, gave us this notion of a social contract, which is kind of uh, another way of uh, kind of thinking ethically. Sorry, I'm just waffling on. But but I think the common good is kind of related to this notion of a social contract. Ah, yes, so maybe 
you can pull up, uh, if you can insert that um, a question, that multiple choice question. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I was just trying to, uh, it seems that the, um, the, the poll question is limited to the number of characters, so I tried to rewrite it. Oh. But I'll, I'll I'll post it. Let's have a look. Um, I'll post it if you don't don't agree. How many words have? Ha, how many I words can you have? Not not sure. But here, look. I'll start the poll. Yeah, just start the poll. Yeah. yeah one of the okay, two. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe uh, maybe I'll just uh, talk through these uh, these multiple choice things before you start yep. answering, students. Uh, one of the ethical duties of professionals, Kantian analysis. Uh, how would you determine uh, uh, these duties? So, in other words, uh, what the full question uh, said, let me actually um, pull it up because it was in the email. I said to. Uh, 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 oh, yeah, make a few here. Yeah, 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 do that, do that. Yeah. I'll just put it in the chat so it's in the chat now. Okay, yeah, okay, so the chat, uh, finding the duties of a professional is one element of undertaking a Kantian analysis or deontological ethical analysis. How would you determine what the duties are for an IT professional? Now, the reason why uh, I'm asking that question, right, is that if you look at the assignment one specification, uh, the, the the person that is uh, the, the principal character I think, in, in that uh, Scenario, right? Is is an IT uh, professional? You know, so if I just um, read the first paragraph of the scenario from assignment one, Beatrice Yang is employed as a senior software engineer for the Cyberdyne Corporation. She uses her exceptional talent in machine learning to develop sophisticated artificial intelligence systems for business use. Uh, and uh, and then and then the scenario uh, goes on, but. Um, the uh, issue is that uh, she disagrees with uh, company policy you know, uh, because um, uh, the um, company decides that uh, terms such as master and slave uh, are deemed to be distasteful uh, because GitHub has actually kind of banned uh, their use for um, reasons uh, that are the result of the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protests in the United States, right? Um, and uh, and master and slave have connotations to uh, the um, her uh, horrendous uh, era of human slavery. And uh, uh, Beatrice Yang is is a fan of uh, Jordan Peterson. I think. Yes, Be Beatrice Yang is incensed by the new ruling of her employer. She claims that it is political correctness gone wild and something that will restrict her creative freedom as a professional. Beatrice is a fan of Jordan Peterson, and I'm sure that if we let um, Ilya talk about Jordan Peterson, we could be here for several hours. <laughs> uh, but if you want to actually sample Jordan Peterson, uh, student audience, just uh, look at the bottom of um, uh, the week two and three learning materials uh, section and there's an interview with uh, Jordan Peterson uh, from, uh, uh, I think, ABC TV. Uh, so it will give you an idea of um, how Jordan Peterson thinks. So uh, based on uh, personal principles, Beatrice refuses to comply with the new edict in abandoning selecting coding terms. She's counseled by a line manager and told that if she does not follow the company line, then her job position could be demoted or she could even be terminated. You know? So what is right and wrong about Beatrice's actions regarding her opposition to the ban on certain coding terms by the Cyberline Corporation? You know, so basically what you have to do with this scenario is kind of discuss issues of you know right versus wrong in terms of Beatrice's actions. You know? so, so so Beatrice is basically told to do something, she disagrees with it, you know, because it you know um, she doesn't think it's right. It's political correctness going crazy. And which brings us back to this quiz. Uh, find the duties, uh, finding the duties of a professional is one element of undertaking Kenny analysis. Uh, how do you determine what the duties are for an IT professional? And oh, only two people have voted. You know? So in other words, right? Um, uh, would you phone a friend? Would you read the back of a cornflakes packet? Would you find a, a code of conduct for an IT professional society? Would you talk to a hairdresser? You know. So, what do people think? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can't. Can I? 
<laughs> you can't vote. You can't vote. But I'm just wondering. You know, let's see. Everybody's got to vote, right? But that's, that's the thing. You've got to. You've got to actually cast your vote. Everybody's got to. And, and I think what's going to happen usually is that you know, even if you don't know the right answer, you'll just be looking and seeing who's actually voting for the option that has the most, and then you pick that one. You know, because there's still five people to do. Who, who do you think vote it? for the cornflakes packet? <laughs> no, no, because the thing is, what? Look, don't you, don't you ever read the back of the cornflakes? I mean, it's like I love that. I've got nothing else to do, right? I'm reading the back of the cornflakes. I made right? my choice because someone said phone a friend. <laughs> The reason why I said phone a friend, right, is that if you want to be a millionaire like Eddie Maguire, you know, are you going to ask the audience? Are you gonna <laughs> <laughs> hey, what if five people? Hey, look, the people that don't respond, just pick something. <laughs> oh, they're probably not listening, right? They're, okay, they're thinking that we've actually, uh, yeah, we're, we're actually taking a role. role. Yeah, we're taking the role. Taking a role. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but, you, uh, okay, okay. I, logically speaking, when you when yes. you actually become an employee, you go through yeah, yeah. induction, right? Induction process for the first. Yeah, 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 yeah. And your your hand in the old days used to be this huge book, like a big man, <laughs> and they throw it on your desk and say, so you, uh, you look through the company policies, and the company policies yeah. will actually have in there an ethics ethics part, right? The code of conduct yeah. and so forth. And if you actually have a look, uh, most most companies have uh, the, they use like the standard one like we even teach it in business business information is like uh, they just you know, copy a standard framework from somewhere and yeah. then they tack their own stuff on right? yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and it would be really nice to see a comparison between different organizations in the same type of industry to see what did they actually add in and are there any conflicts between the two two companies it'd be really good to see well, actually, I, I worked for a, a, a company once, right, and I think they had a code of conduct, but it, but they had, like, something that was tacked on. And it was, yeah. was kind of yeah. odd, and it was more like, if, if you have a fist fight in the office, it's immediate dismissal. <laughs> so I thought, I thought, Which means what, it must have happened. It must have happened, you know, so it's more like, you have to actually put this in explicitly, you know, because yeah. people can't kind of just dance around it, right? It's like you have a fist yeah. fight, it's immediate dismissal, but, you know. Yeah, but, but uh, there should have been a sub clause saying um, if you're in a fist fight, make sure you're in management. <laughs> 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 then you are safe. <laughs> you, you, you know, once upon a time, right, uh, they actually had a job classification in the United States for uh, ethics officer. Uh, I think it was after one of the uh, global financial crises, and uh, people thought, oh, well, uh, you know, maybe to alleviate uh, this, I mean, to stop this from happening again. We need to actually have a member of staff that is actually responsible for ethics, etc. Right? Um, yeah. And and it was you know and nothing really happened. Right? I think you know I, I think it was actually right before the second global financial crisis when they had uh, you know I think it was Enron you know like Enron yeah. Yeah. did all those nasty things in the, in the United States right and then Enron's accounting firm was Arthur Anderson. And then Arthur Anderson got tanked as well. So they completely vanished, you know, basically. So you had two, like, mighty organizations. Because I think Enron was a utilities provider, electricity, and all the, the forms yeah. of energy, right? And, uh, and, and the fact is they, they really massively screwed up and kind of, you know, ruined people's lives across the United States. You know, uh, people lost fortunes, etc. And they had this documentary, um, which you can probably, ah, I'm going to try and find it, you know, uh, on RMIT Netflix. Because RMIT Netflix has a lot of interesting stuff, right? But oh, the, I'm going uh, to close the poll. Oh, you close, you close the poll. Okay, so, okay, let me... Let me just, uh, before I actually waffle on about Enron, uh, the answer is number three, find a code of conduct for an IT professional society. So in other words, uh, you know, if you're doing, uh, I mean, a Kantian analysis, uh, which is, is based on, uh, uh, you know, what is my duty as a professional, right? First thing that I would do, right, if somebody told me to do a Kantian analysis is, 
what is the profession? If the profession is IT, right? And then you look for IT codes of conduct. You know, so there's uh, the Australian Computer Society, there's the ACM, the, there's the American one, and there's the Software Engineering Code of Conduct. You have a look at a whole bunch of them uh, to get a, a flavor of what the duties are for um, an IT professional. And then uh, is is this person, Beatrice Yang, actually you know transgressing again against any of the precepts? In, in any of the codes of conduct, right? Because remember, the codes of conduct aren't like, uh, you know, road regulations or, or tax law. It's not like something that will get you, I know, you know, yeah. put, you know, up, hanging by your thumbs in the middle of the town square, etc. you know, or, or, or being arrested or something like that. Uh, like, a code of conduct. That would, have, that would have been so useful, really, would have. <laughs> it's a set of guidelines, right? You know, that's you know, what I mean. I, so, 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 so many occasions, uh, it would have been nice to just get the guy who was involved in um, all the bugs and so forth and just tie him up with their thumbs in the canteen, the cafeteria. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, it, that's too game of thrown it, right? But, uh, but it's, it's more like, oh yeah, but the thing about the bugs you're saying, right? The, yeah, the, see, oh, that's yeah. interesting as well. Once upon a time, right, and, and maybe I'm digressing in a positive way you now. Hmm. Once upon a time, uh, bugs in code were a way uh, to actually punish programmers. You know, so people would say, oh yeah, there's a bug in the code. Yeah. Somebody's responsible for this. Let's find oh, who it is and get rid of them or embarrass them, right? And then the new philosophy now is that because systems are so complex, right, uh, no one person, a group of people, is responsible for a bug. Bugs are almost like this, um, you know, magical entity that just emerges from complexity, right? So it's more like, and and I think that that philosophy of dealing with bugs comes from, uh, you know, the kind of splinter ideas for designing code, like extreme programming. I don't know. Have you heard of extreme programming? No, I've never used it. Never used it. I, oh, I, know, yeah, but, I know the yeah. extreme, not programming, but extreme uh, design methodology. But uh, yeah, extreme yeah. design yeah. design methodology was basically um, <clears throat> use a draft and build the draft. So there was no going back to the office and building a new app. Um, mm. yeah. But but extreme programming, I'm not sure. Uh, design yeah. methodology, yeah. Because the thing with extreme programming that I remember, right, is that uh, there's a lot of interesting things about it, right? Like when yeah. you, you do code uh, and you follow the extreme programming ethos, you're not alone. You always do it in pair programming. Yeah, so someone always way. looking over your shoulder. Yeah. Like, like good cop, bad cop, that kind of thing. And the other thing is it's not just good cop, bad cop in terms of you know coding uh, pairs, but you also have a client being part of the um, part of a kind of small group. And even though the client may not know nothing about coding or anything, they're almost like a kind of devil's advocate, you know. Yeah. So uh, to me, the best example is uh, I'm a big fan of science fiction films. Uh, the the second Alien film, you know, Aliens, right? Where I think Paul Reiser, uh, you must have seen Aliens, haven't you? Aliens? Yeah, well, yeah, 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 definitely. yeah. Yeah, remember Paul Reiser? Uh, he's that kind of uh, devious company representative, right? And he goes along on a mission with Ripley and the uh, interstellar marines to actually save the people on the colony because, you know, uh, the people in this colony have probably been, you know, attacked by the aliens, right? Uh, and, 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 and it's more like, why is Paul Reiser, the company exec, just trotting along with a bunch of marines, right? Oh, yeah, it's probably extreme programming. No, but he's there for a reason because you find out at the end, spoiler alert. Uh, can, can I tell you? Can I tell you the the one num, number one flaw in extreme programming? Yeah, um, yeah. Is, is as soon as you get the customer involved and you give them snippets, uh, yeah. the customer after after a while you you give them like three four versions of your application, you know, like the yeah. um, iterations, and yeah. they just they just get pissed off and just uh, look, stop sending me junk crap. Give me the working product. <laughs> oh, just, oh, it, yeah. It collapses. Yeah, it collapses badly with customers. Yeah, I mean, see, see the other thing now. Now we, we're going to start talking about software engineering. It's like uh, you, you, you reminded me of prototypes, right? Because when yeah, I used to, uh, when I used to teach uh, systems implementation, and I talked about extreme programming and agile and all those kind of things, right? And the um, thing that I would always talk about is the danger of using prototypes, right? Because a client might think, 
oh, the prototype's just fine. We'll just have that. But don't bother giving us anything. Yeah, prototypes never never enough. They just want more and more. And then uh, right. you get into a scope scope creep. Um, and uh, anyway, it just it, yeah, it, it it sounds good, but it's got to be really well managed. Same as agile. Agile. It just every, everybody just jumps onto these, you know, bandwagon. Oh, oh, agile. You know, I must know agile. It's just, uh, yeah, okay. It's got its limits as well. Everything in life has. But um, agile. As soon as you be, you can be in an interview, and someone says agile, say, oh yes, I'm familiar with Scrum. And the guy who's interviewing you will immediately think you're some expert in um, in agile. Right? And all you're doing is you're getting together, you know, having a few beers, trying to get some code out. That, there's your scrum. <laughs> okay, now I've just put up a quote which is related yep. to our current uh, discussion you know, about bugs in software. Hmm. Uh, and this uh, quote is from a very, very famous philosopher. Uh, hmm. Be not ashamed of mistakes yep. and thus make them crimes. Yep. Uh, who yep. do you think the philosopher is, uh, and uh, oh, okay, uh, his name begins with C. And it's and it's, and it's not Dan Andrews. Well, <laughs> it's a philosopher. A name begins with C, and uh, he's only got one name, like Madonna. You know, so you know. Whoa. Okay, I'll 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 I'll. I'll, 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 I'll. Oh, Constantine. Constantine. Oh, Confucius. Okay. Yes, Confucius, finally. <laughs> yeah, Jessica got to be a did. Well done. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm just trying. <laughs> Connor as well. Well done. <laughs> okay, Connor the philosopher, right? <laughs> You're in my books. you got to get extras. <laughs> no, no. But see, yeah, well done. I, I'm, I'm told that I'm not supposed to say Confucius. It's Western yeah. imperialism, right? It's probably pronounced a certain way. Confucius, yeah. probably, yeah. I think. Yes. But, but he did say, apparently, be not ashamed of mistakes and thus make them cry, which is kind of the modern ethos, right, yes. of software engineering, right? You know, don't be ashamed of bugs. They're there, mm -hmm. you, know? Uh, you know, and accept them. You know, because I once read a, a book on um, famous entrepreneurs, right? And, and one yeah. of the things that this author was saying, right, is that if you're an entrepreneur, it's almost like you're, uh, you know, uh, uh, a borderline sociopath. You know? But also, also as an entrepreneur, you're not afraid of actually losing everything, you know, losing a fortune, and then kind of, you know, uh, getting the money back, etc. You know, because if you look at a lot of famous entrepreneurs, they've actually failed spectacularly sometimes, often, but, and then come back uh, and succeeded wildly and. One famous person in this respect is Steve Jobs. Remember Steve Jobs? If you look at the, the history of Steve Jobs, right? Those two movies, uh, the one with Michael Fassbinder and the other one with Ashton Kutcher, right? Well, particularly the one with uh, Michael Fassbinder, right? Is that, you know, uh, there was a time when, you know, uh, Jobs and, and Wozniak started Apple and mm -hmm. kind of did well. And all of a sudden, Jobs gets kicked out and uh, John Scully, uh, heads Apple and John Scully's only claim to fame. Well, he did run the Coca-Cola Corporation, but it's more like why put a, a person that runs a soft drink company is in charge of a, you know, computer company. But but the problem was, I think, that Jobs actually hired Scully. I think famously kind of said, "Well, come to us. You don't want to be running, you know, a company that you know just makes lolly water." You know. For the rest of your life, etc. I, I have to put a uh, caveat on that uh, Confucius quote. Um, yeah. If it says, "Do you know? Be be not ashamed of mistakes, but but don't flaunt them." Right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, look look how many mistakes I can make. Uh, oh, no. I no. <laughs> Actually, no, I, no I, see, see you, you put me on another tangent. I'll be going on so many tangents. I'll come back to the right way around eventually. Right. <laughs> But there's a, there's a guy in the US, right? Yeah. yeah. And he, for one year, he did this like crazy project. He, he did everything in, in life to get rejected. <laughs> so so he, he applied for jobs that he knew that he wouldn't get. He asked, you know, women out that he knew wouldn't, you know, say yes, etc. Yeah. That kind of thing, right? And he just kept a diary of all this. And he wrote a book about it. 
so the thing is basically he, he did things which most humans would hate because most humans would hate rejection right but he actually turned this into something which kind of made him a short time a celebrity you know at least he got a book out here except for that kind of thing, you know? I need to find that guy's article because he, he actually wrote it, wrote it up I think in Bloomberg Business Week you know my year of rejection that kind of thing you know it's like uh, we used to. We used to. Um, well, I did anyway. I used to um, uh, experiment with section managers. So yeah. I, I would keep um, keep a you know keep a really close eye on what's actually happening budget wise. Yeah. And, so yeah. 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 Ones, you know, and you would see out of uh, three three um, <clears throat> section managers, um, one would really be performing well, and the other guys would be you know like be sort of mediocre. One really bad. But, and so what I would do is, um, uh, uh, like on a on a yearly basis, I would actually switch them around. Right? Yeah. Uh, I'd say, now you're in charge of you know voice voice over IP. You're on you know <clears throat> on the GUI and so forth, right? Yeah. And doing the switch around, the entire yeah. entire performance, all three of them would just skyrocket. Right? Yeah. It's a really interesting um, um, uh, of, in management. If you ever get a chance, you know, try it. But uh, you'll get one guy who's who's super good at what he's doing, and yep. uh, and he's performing really well. And the other guy's not performing well. Yep. Uh, just switch him around, and you'll actually see the not performing well will actually perform almost outperform the um, the 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 better section manager uh, in the first few weeks. But, Oh, didn't they do that in McDonald's stores? Didn't they have a policy once where, like, once a year, they would have uh, people from management actually working at the counter selling burgers? Yeah, it yeah. was like for the uh, you know charity day, etc. That kind of. Stuff. Well, I, 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 I'd, I'd say yeah, uh, that's a bit of a different scenario where um, uh, the manager should actually know or be experienced in doing the dirty work. But, uh, if if you just get a manager in from another another company. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Performance-wise, yeah, right. But you, you really like. Ideally, you'd love someone who actually has got his hands dirty and so forth in that organisation, not from another one. So does that mean a janitor should have PhDs? Well, even janitor, uh, even the office staff. We used to. Well, well yeah. I did. We used to say on a on a weekly basis, right? Everybody clean up, clean up. But uh, you. Ah. Have to, we're going to take yeah. half an hour, just half yeah. an hour break, just take everything, like like clean up everything, and we'd go through with a big rubbish bin, and all the rubbish we'd go through. Um, yeah. So they actually did the hard yards, not not just um, you know programming and designing and all that sort of stuff, but they actually did the cleanups as well. See, it's interesting I, you I mentioned that. I, I, actually, you're very. You, uh, I did get one guy who was a real stickler, right? yeah. and uh, he he said, "No, it's not part of my job job description." <laughs> of being clean. <laughs> yeah, well, basically, yeah, yeah, was, uh, that's not part of my job description. And I thought, oh, no, but, but see, but see, this week's theme is is ethics, uh, a cultural view, right? And and I think culture. Uh, what exactly is culture? And there's workplace culture, for example, which is kind of what you're describing, you know. And and often when people, you know, uh, apply for a job, I mean, the people in HR would think, well, is there a cultural fit? Does this people, mm. does this person fit into our culture? It's and one of the even for these, you know, like uh, things which are not related to your skills, you know, like, yep. uh, you know. Or would you do things like clean up after yourself, you know, and even simple yep. things like dishwasher, you know, like uh, most uh, yep. workplaces would have a communal dishwasher, for example, like, yep. and we have a communal dishwasher uh, on our floor, right? And, 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 and when we were back in the office, I was almost the unofficial monitor of the dishwasher. It was more like, yep. you know, people didn't give me the job, but I got, you know, irritated because other people would never like fill the dishwasher up or fill it up improperly and stuff like that, you know. Um, and uh, and and often, you know, like like sometimes I would kind of be really, you know, maybe crazy and put post-it notes on the dishwasher and say, you know, rinse the dishes before putting it in, etc. And that kind of thing. Or then people would have discussions. With me. But why should we? Rinse I'm, I'm the completely dishes? behind you. Though. I'm completely behind you. I, I think uh, everyone should have that mentality when you eat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it, and the worst thing, and, and I've I've seen it many times. Worst thing I've ever seen is uh, people just take um, a coffee cup and I yeah. just leave it 
beside the sink. Oh, yeah, that's my pet peeve as well, right? Yeah. And uh, my golden rule was uh, you always um, return things, you know, same or better. Right? So um, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna use it, clean it so it's the same as it was before. Don't don't give it to us dirty, right? And expect someone else to do your hard yards. Right? I mean, uh, a, good, a good test for you too, uh, which we used to do, um, is if the CEO MD would come walking through on a visit, um, I would actually scrunch up a piece of paper and just throw a few down the corridor and see see whether the guy picks them up or not. Oh, yeah. You see, what you uh, said now reminded me of something that this person did. I'm just typing his name. Yeah. If you, uh, if you just uh, walk through, because we used to have, like, on a yearly basis, yeah. we would have uh, the visit from, like, the, uh, you know, the president, uh, Suzuki, would come through. Um, so he'd fly in from Japan, and um, <clears throat> as he's walking on with his entourage and so forth, uh, before he actually got there, I'd just throw a few pieces of paper around, and I'd, I'd sort of uh, watch him he come back and pass, shake your hand. And uh, Suzuki would actually bend down, he'd pick it up, put it in his pocket. But, but the person that I just typed in now, John Maynard Keynes, does anybody know who Keynes was? No. Anyone? Uh, let me, Anyone? Let me look it up. Anyone? Mm. So, General Lewis, he's a famous British economist, right? But, but yeah. legend has it, right, that uh, he went into a, a restaurant, you know, with, yeah. uh, with one of his uh, colleagues, right, and actually, yeah. um, you know, dropped a, a napkin or a towel on the, on, the, on the floor of the restaurant, right? Uh, after he had used, after he wiped his hands, right, and the colleague says, "Why are you doing yeah. such bad manners?" It's, no, I'm giving, uh, I'm giving the people that work here something to do, so they're actually employed. If if I if I do everything, right, then the people don't have less to do. If if everybody kept on doing everything themselves, then there wouldn't be need to have that many employees. So he was trying to justify, kind of being deliberately messy for reasons of economics and kind of crazy. I suppose it has a on it, but, it, but, it, but his little test would also see whether the staff have some kind of respect for their own um, own restaurant. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the other thing about workplace culture right, and, and ethics, right, is mm -hmm. is uh, the shared fridge. So the shared fridge. So what mm -hmm. we have is uh, a, a kind of almost like a code of conduct for fridge use, right? And one of the things that it says, don't take food that doesn't belong to you, because I think for a while there, there was a spate of, uh, you know, food that went missing, right? And in the US, uh, if you look online, there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, notes that people have put on fridges to try and get their sandwiches back, you know, embarrassing people, saying, you know, like, uh, can you please not take my sandwich anymore because I spent a long time cooking it. Why can't you actually, you know, spend your own money and buy your own sandwich, etc. And... And, and, and I remember that happened once, uh, several years ago, somebody took some yogurt from one of the admin people. She sent an email out to everybody saying, you know, why did you take my yogurt? You know, it's, it's, it, it only cost $2, that kind of thing. It sounded so sad. You know? um, but, 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 but one thing, innovation, right? There was a, a, a company that actually came up with plastic wrappers for sandwiches to stop theft in fridges, right? And the wrappers had uh, this pattern on the plastic that made it look like bread mold. You know, so if you looked at the, um, at the at the bag, it looked like, you know, it had moldy bread in it, but it didn't. It was just a, you know, <laughs> camouflage, you know, like mold camouflage, that kind of thing, you know. And that's the thing. People would, uh, I, and I was almost like a fridge monitor as well, you know, because people would leave something in there, like a banana, and it would all turn, you know, yucky, etc. That kind of thing, right? And, and then it, I had to throw it away, you know. And often I would put, you know, and also improper storage of things. You know, people would put like ice cream into the, you know, non-freezer section of the fridge, right? <laughs> Thinking, oh, it's going to be there forever. No, it will melt and go through, that kind of thing. You have to put on post-it notes saying, don't put it here. Take it down to the other fridge where the freezer is, you know? So, you know, it, and I think that's just people being, uh, I don't know, not thinking. You know, it's almost like, uh, it, like Socrates said, you know, like feet. You see other people putting stuff where you put it. What comes to mind, that's why I shared the image, was uh, remember the jokes about, oh, there's only one beer in the fridge. So if you, <laughs> you, you, you think, oh, uh, am I ethically sound? Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, I, don't know. I mean, I mean, the thing is, you've got to think about. Okay, if you want to be uh, think about environmental impact. Right. I mean, uh, 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 what's the energy rating on a fridge? Right? The fact that you have multiple fridges in a building means there's a kind of impact on the environment. What's being stored in there? You know, etc. That kind of thing. You know, so it's almost like I'm, maybe I'm well, thinking too much. You know, uh, uh, fridge is, is the most efficient when it's uh, full, right? So like oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're beer, right. It's, it's super inefficient. So, see, yeah. see, that that's the thing, right? Uh, I, I would also notice people putting things like a box of biscuits into a fridge, right? And that's just stupid, don't you think? Putting a box of biscuits into a fridge, right? You know, I mean, well, yeah, it's open to attack. Yeah. No, uh, because yeah. biscuits are meant to be frozen. I mean, like you know, they're, they're yeah. meant to be stored in the cupboard and then eaten within a certain time period. Otherwise, they get all soggy. You know, it's like common things. <laughs> Sorry, but, but just... coming, you, you're giving me memories. Uh, here, I'll give you a situation. Uh, yeah. The um, uh, <clears throat> in in my my area, I would have my office, and and, and the office I had uh, windows which I could see all the stuff. You know? Yeah. Um, now I'll ask you a question. I was, I'll say yeah. uh, I had to I had to get a new printer for for the area, right? and uh, where would you where would you situate the printer? Oh, okay. Uh, oh, good question. Yeah, you're right because hmm. because when they came in, and, and I, I've already told you, it was about yeah, 30, yeah. 32 or thirty-three thousand bucks yeah, for yeah, yeah. Uh, for management services for the year on on one printer. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we literally had like you know a hundred, uh, but but um, uh, in my area. Uh, where would you put this printer? Because when they came through and they said, "Oh, well, yeah, well, we can install it. Where do you want it?" Right? And I, I just went, "Oh, God, uh, right." <laughs> and, and it actually took me. Uh, I sent them away, and it actually took me a couple of days to figure out where I wanted it. So, uh, what do you think went through my head? Where would you put it? And and reasons why you would put it. There. Okay, tell me, tell me. You, you, you're leaving. I was, thinking, I was hoping that you would you would come up with a scenario. So the scenario one, right, is to yeah, put, yeah, it, yeah. put it in an area over in the corner, right, dark area. Yeah, 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 what, yeah. what would happen? What would happen if I put it over there? Like further over in the corner somewhere, which is what most people do. They just put it, put this printer all the way over there in the corner somewhere. What what actually happened? Well, you'd have a, a large crowd in one corner. Right. Correct. Right. Talking yeah. footy yeah. tips and all that rubbish. Right? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So all, all you have is this congregation around a printer all the time. Yeah, right? yeah, so yeah. so um, it, I thought I'll put it in the middle of the middle of the office area. Right. Uh, yeah. What would happen? Yeah. Same kind of deal, but um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They congregate, but in the middle, uh, <clears throat> they're more open to you know people seeing them right? over yeah. that way. It's, yeah, it's like ten yeah. percent of the yeah. stuff was yeah. and. Yeah. and Sure. Anyway, uh, so my final decision was to put the printer right in front of my office, right where the glass is. And that way, uh, all my staff would just come in, grab the grab the print and walk away. They would never congregate around the... Um, around because the, you, you were the boss, because they'd be afraid of, you know... Yeah, correct. That. So, no. so productivity was still there, rather than all the social stuff. Right? Uh, now, yeah, I'm going to change, yeah. change the yeah. argument. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Where did I put the coffee machine? Oh. So, <laughs> just away from you, right? Because people are going to be congregating around the coffee machine, right? You know? No, no, here, here I'll, I'll tell yeah. you, you probably hate me, right? But uh, I put the coffee machine right between the men's and women's toilets. Why? Because no one wants to hang around in front of toilets. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Then, then you should have actually put one coffee machine in both the men and the women's toilet <laughs> inside it, <laughs> and that's where the fridge should be as well. <laughs> but was I ethical? I don't know. <laughs> no, you were being devious, trying to manipulate people. You're like people in retail, you know. Yeah. Oh no, supermarkets! Remember, every time you go to a supermarket and you go to the checkout, right? What do you see at the checkout? Chocolate, lots of chocolate, right? You know, it's almost like impulse buy, right? The last minute grab, yeah. Now, uh, I just put up another quote. Right? This yep. Is another, one of my favorite quotes, and, and I'll read it out, and then I'll and then I'll 
ask everyone to try and guess who said that. If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets, even as Michelangelo painted, oh, or Beethoven composed music, or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should yeah. sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. Who said that? Yeah, we know. Oh, I won't say. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll just put in the first initial. Starts with M. Starts with M. 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 Yeah. M. M. First, first name M. First name, first name. Okay. Oh, this is like charades, right? Yeah. It's, great. <laughs> it's like, it's like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Martin. Martin. Yes. Ah, yay! You won! Yay! It's like first playing heck. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, you know, Martin yeah. Luther King, right? So, in other words, what Martin Luther King was basically saying, say, right, is don't say, oh, well, you know, just because I've got some kind of crappy job, right, I can't be great. No, you can be great even you if you supposedly have the lowliest job, right? Because it's a, it's a matter of, you know, how much effort you want to put into what you do. Attention to detail once again, you know, so, you know. Ah, okay, uh, uh, maybe it's time for that um, other question, if you can... I'm trying to format it. On it's utilitarianism, too, I think. Yeah, it's too I think it's utilitarianism. Yeah. Formatting it, right? Yeah, I'm, See, I'm trying to, but... I'm too verbose, because yeah, well, would normally say that uh, I would never succeed in American industry because I use too many words. <laughs> Uh, it won't take it. It won't take it. No, oh, it's too it's too long again. Um, so. I'll I'll let you um, shorten in your way, and then we'll just put it into the um, text comments, etc. I, I have a question for you. Yes, um, you have a question. Yeah. Uh, about slavery. You know who else likes slavery? Uh, our friend, yeah. uh, Mr. Cantor. Yep. Uh, Mr. Cantor and I had so many conversations about slavery, you know. So do, do you think um, uh, slavery of the blacks compared to slavery of the whites, um, which one was, was, was actually the first to be initiated? Which, which whites are you talking about? I'll just put it up here. Sorry. I'll just, I'll just put it up. It's better than trying to... Uh, oh, you're doing a quiz on that now, right? No, 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 no. But but you see, the thing is, what people talk about slavery now is slavery of AI. I mean, the thing is, people are saying, well, someday we may have. Oh, okay. Watch with slaves. Did Did you know that? Oh, you mean like Egypt? I think that's the uh, when they. No, was in Africa. It was Africa. Africa. They were all white, white slaves, and they actually began uh, a lot earlier than uh, black slave trade. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting fact, right? Because yeah. uh, we look up and I always thought, um, I just, the way we argue all the time with uh, the people around, uh, it was always slavery was just associated with black people. Well, I, I mean, the thing about, say, slavery in, in the United States, right, um, yeah. it, it's kind of, well, when they had the Civil War in America, it, it was kind of complicated. Why, why did you have North versus South fighting each other, right? Uh, and, and kind of, you know, historically it would be, you know, okay, opposition to slavery, Abraham Lincoln was against it. But it was also, you know, for, on economics because the South was actually kind of, uh, well, kind of rich in, in a sense because uh, they depended on slavery. And maybe the North were kind of jealous in a sense, you know. So it's like, well, we can't be as successful as you guys because you have slaves. But we can't say that because then, you know, we would be deemed to be immoral, that kind of thing. You know? So uh, uh, I, I think once upon a time, and if you will, uh, somebody tried to encapsulate that for me in one sentence, it was King Cotton versus King Wheat, I think. You know, the fact that you know, I think the southern states made a lot of money from cotton crops, which could be you know uh, picked by slaves, right? And I think the North was wheat, which was more like mechanical. You know, or I'm not sure if they had mechanical devices for harvesting wheat in that time. You know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So, um, I, I, it was economics versus morality. I think that you know was the tension. I think in the. But, but the interesting thing was I couldn't find the article. Was um, the uh, the number of uh, uh, 
uh, blacks which were taken to America as slaves mm -hmm. is actually far, far lower than there were white slaves. Yeah. Yeah, which is an interesting. Yeah, I, I couldn't find the article though. Damn. Uh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It, which was another interesting fact. I, I didn't realise that uh, whites were more of slaves than uh, blacks. Yeah. But if you do want to actually, a uh, 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 two classic uh, television series, if people want to, want to find it, uh, that look at, uh, I guess, the history of uh, American slavery, uh, Roots, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think there were two TV series, which I think I've found them in bits and pieces on YouTube. Uh, and uh, they were based on a, a novel by uh, uh, an American author, Alex Haley. Um, Kind of interesting, and I think it was remade recently. Hang on, I've nearly got this bit. Of, um, I'm, I'm thinking. Am. I'm thinking that maybe. Is there any way to actually do this uh, automatically, or? or yeah, yeah. Um, you, you have to. Yeah, you, you have oh, to. Okay. okay. Yeah. The actual question, I'll put in the chat. Okay. Yeah. 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 In the chat. And okay, another spin on deontological analyses is the rights based approach. Because if you look at um, uh, the uh, Makula Center for Applied Ethics, they're very heavy on uh, a rights based approaches, you know, and kind of saying, well, that's Kantian as well, which is true. Because if you're doing a Kantian analysis, it can be based on, uh, you know, uh, duties, rights, traditions, etc. So how would you determine the generic rights of a human being? You know? So for example, like Beatrice Yang in the scenario assignment one might be saying it's my right to actually do this. You know? So what are the, the generic rights of a human being? Right? And I think uh, there's, the, um, there's the quiz. How would you determine the generic rights of a human being? Is it Apple, United Nations, University, hey, Orange, right? Orange, or the Communist Manifesto? <laughs> I forgot Das Kapital. Right? <laughs> yes, it's going to outweigh the United Nations. <laughs> but the thing is, you shouldn't ask me to do multiple choice quizzes for actual assessment. <laughs> Because I'm a big fan of apple, orange, banana, at the right answer. <laughs> well, one of the questions is you should have put a poll up saying which one is more left, the United <laughs> Nations, the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Anyhow, I think. I yeah. think. I think. Uh, I'm not going to have to balance it out. I, I, look, I, I just had to do it. I put out. <laughs> I, I had to click that just to in, balance in, in it. Anyway, the right answer is number two. <laughs> it's not the only answer, but it's the best answer. Uh, so <laughs> if you Google United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, then it would give you something, a document, right? Uh, and if we uh, if we go to it, I'm just trying to see. It's not, it's not that complicated. Uh, human rights. Human rights. Yes, yeah, okay. Uh, oh no, it is kind of long. Holy hell, it's long. Oh, Article 1. Ah, yes. Article 1. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Uh, Article 3. Uh, everyone has a right to life, liberty, and security of person. Uh, no slavery. Uh, freedom, 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 uh, no torture, uh, equality in eyes of law. Um. I, I have a, I have, a, I have an issue with all that. What? And the issue is uh, the UN keeps harping on about you know freedom rights and all this yeah, sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but the UN also suppresses what you can say, what you can do, so they govern really heavily. So how free are people to make their own decisions and so Okay, so okay. Then, then here's the right actually are there if someone's suppressing what you, what you want to say. If I want to say something, I want to say that, but you can't because the UN just said you're not allowed to say that. Okay, then here's homework. Is there a code of conduct for the United Nations? 
Oh. I'm guessing is like if the UN has uh, a, a, a declaration of human rights, which is for all of humanity, do they themselves has an organization of the code of conduct? And how easy is it to find it? You know? uh, because uh, I think uh, I, I did once upon a time search for uh, codes of conduct for security organizations, you know, like in Australia. Uh, we have uh, ASIO and uh, the Australian Sig Signals Directorate and I think ASIS, for example. And ASIO has uh, a very simple, you know, code of conduct. You know, ASIO are the people that actually spy on us, not us now, but I mean, like, you know, security organization, for example. And and that and, and I haven't actually looked for uh, the biggie, the uh, CIA uh, code of conduct. Which just just kind of curious, CIA. I should, I should email uh, one of my best friends from university. Uh, his name was Jalal One Hussein, right? <laughs> and and when 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 we went through uni, yeah. he um, I I didn't realise until I think it was third year. <clears throat> he said uh, we were talking about the UN, and he said, uh, "Yeah, my my dad's part of the UN." I said, yeah. "What?" <laughs> and he showed us a um, Time magazine article. Yeah. And he said, there it is there. And it was a photo of, uh, you know, how they've got the amphitheatre. Yeah. And you see this guy there sort of leaning back with his head sort of arched backwards and his yeah. mouth open, you know, yeah. pointing to the sky, snoring away, right? And he yeah. said, that's my dad. <laughs> ah. In the UN, yeah. yeah. I should email him and say, does your dad actually follow the human rights stuff? And, and, yeah. Yeah, there it is, CIA. Uh, the core values. Uh, I mean, well, this is close enough. I think they do have a more complicated um, code of ethics, but a value is important because I think, in a sense, right, that's what ethics is about. Ethics is about what we value in life. In fact, uh, ethics is a, a, a branch of um, a, a sub branch of philosophy called axiology. So, axiology is the uh, study of values or consideration of values and you can have values of morality or values of beauty and these are the core values of the CIA so core values guide our professional and personal action service we put country first and agency before self quiet patriotism blah 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 integrity we uphold high standards of conduct we speak the truth excellence we hold ourselves and each other to the highest standards embrace ah excellence you see you know what that third value is what I always say Attention to detail. And I think what the CIA by that value is trying to say is actually attention to detail, not like uh, a minimum requirement. Because I think often, and when I used to teach, I think, project management, I think the thing that I used to say is the notion of excellence has kind of been debased. It's more like just meeting certain base level standards. And it's almost like how people put things out to tender. And, you know, you get the person who actually, you know, uh, has the cheapest tender and they win. I think, I don't know, maybe you know more about this, Ilya. Than I. Well, I, I question the, um, the excellence. It's like who actually measures it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Too. But, but the thing is, even, but then, but then if you're talking about ethics, for example, who actually measures, you know, uh, that you're actually, you know, to a certain standard on, you know, a code of conduct that you know uh, dictates how your profession should actually behave, right? Yes. Because yes. often I think that yes. that ethics is is very kind of personal in a sense. Even though ethics is about kind of values that apply to a group of people, right? Yes. It, it's about moral choices that people, that individuals make. Hmm. You know, um, that's why I kind of think that you know if you're teaching ethics, right, in any me medical, engineering, IT, etc. It's very much about, you know, uh, how a person personally views um, what's right versus wrong. You know, you can't, um, in, in other words, you can't have a group project in ethics, I think, in a certain <laughs> Because then it would be more like, you know, whoever's the smartest, you know, that can give us a HD, then kind of dictates what's right or wrong, you know, in terms of, you know, what the outcome is of this ethics project. Whereas I think each person should kind of find their own, you know, Direction of their moral compass. Yeah. yeah. This oh, is we um, had a good discussion with my son and all of his mates on the uh, on the internet, um, yeah. and that's where he he went on for three hours, like yeah. to I think three thirty in the morning or something. But um, uh, we discussed the fact about uh, 
you know, uh, like an organisation has ethics, yeah. but, but the morals of the management uh, may actually be different to the ethical standards or the you know, code of conduct. So, uh, what, and we started talking about the difference between ethics and morals. You know? yeah. And uh, and my son said, oh, you know, ethics, E, everybody, morals, M, me. You know? um, and then we started looking at uh, if you have um, morals, you, you, you have to build up your morals. They must come from everybody, which is the ethical yeah. community, yeah. or your parents and so forth. Now, yeah. when you have your morals. Uh, how did you actually acquire any, you know, contra uh, like contra like if you've got um, morals which don't fit the ethical standard? How did you actually get those? How did you attend? Uh, you know, how did you how did you learn these morals? Like if you're a psychopath, how did you actually find find that these morals which conflict with the group ethics, uh, and you accept your morals? How, how did you actually learn them? Right? Yeah. Well, it's interesting, you mentioned, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned psychopaths or sociopaths. I mean, the, the, the psychopath would be the kind of, you know, Hannibal Lecter kind of thing, the, the extreme. Oh, yeah. I, I, I really yeah. quickly interject. Yeah. Sure, yeah. It's a great topic because when he's on that computer with his friends doing, you know, League of Losers and whatever it is, uh, yeah. that was three and a half hours where all of them were not playing that rubbish. They were actually yeah. discussing ethics. It was amazing. Anyway, go. Oh no, no, but, 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 but see, like like a, like a psychopath is, is an extreme form of yes. uh, a being a sociopath, right? And, and a sociopath is still kind of bad, but I think a lot of people might be sociopaths and even kind of high achievers because from my understanding of what a sociopath is, right, and there's even like a category like a corporate psychopath mm. or a corporate sociopath, right? Uh, just somebody that doesn't have a kind of uh, sense of empathy. They don't kind of, you know, uh, feel what their actions uh, do to other people, you know, they, they, you know, uh, so, oh, yeah, they might do something terrible, right? It hurts other people's feelings, but they don't know this because they they lack um, empathy, right? And if, if you lack empathy to a certain degree, right, then, you know, you can perhaps have, exhibit sociopathic tendencies, but still be a high achiever, that kind of thing, you know? Um, oh, so I, I've just put up that article, you say morals, I say. Let's, let's let's say because um, we we discussed this with them as well. Let's say um, you you are some kind of you know uh, psycho killer, right? Um, yep. uh, in your in your head, you would actually think that you're doing the right thing because you, you you agree with it. It's part of your morals, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Like, but but with society, it's not. So um, how do you attend to someone who's got these wild uh, you can't just lock them up in jail, right? Uh, how, do, how do you retrain that brain to actually be part of the greater good, right? common good? Right? Uh, if you get it's a really complex uh, subject, it's like um, uh, like this guy goes around murdering people. He thinks he like he gets a kick out of it, and he thinks he's doing the right thing, right? He's thinking, oh, you know, it's okay for me, right? But not for society. All of a sudden, you come along and you slap handcuffs on them. They're confused, thinking, "What's going on? How do you actually change them uh, into?" Do you, know, do you know what I mean? And and the same sort of thing can can happen. And it's it's really far fetched, but the same deal happens when um, new management comes into an organisation. The organisation has its own set of values right? and own set of ethics. And this guy will come in from ANZ Bank or you know, IBM, whoever. Uh, he has been indoctrinated with whatever that other society or that organisation has already, you know, instilled in him. When he comes over, how do you challenge him? I, I just put up a, a, a quote. Sometimes I use this in the past in class. Uh, right is right, even uh, if no one is doing it. Wrong is wrong, even if everyone is doing it. You know, and I think. Uh, it's basically more like, well, you know, if everybody is doing something wrong, it's still wrong, even if everyone is doing it. So at, at some points in human history, everybody was doing the wrong thing, right? And then one person kind of saw, hey, this is wrong. You know? And that requires a lot of courage. So courage is, you know, a supreme virtue, you know, from Aristotle, you know. Um, and, and it's more like, okay, if you, were, if you were alive during the Roman Empire, for example, right? 
uh, life was great if you were a Roman citizen, but not so great if you were anyone else, especially a slave. You know, you weren't even, you know, a, a human being. You were kind of uh, owned by you know, a Roman citizen, for example, right? Um, and and you know, if you look at uh, a Roman life from now, it's kind of very ruthless and morally abhorrent because of you know, mistreatment of human beings, as, as slaves, etc. You know, and I don't know, were there people around uh, during the time of uh, slavery in the Roman Empire that did oppose slavery? Probably not, you know, because if you did oppose slavery, it meant you were opposing the empire, right? And even the people that we talk about in this course, you know, like uh, Plato and uh, Aristotle, etc., right? Uh, they both had slaves, I see, you know, I mean, I'm not sure about uh, Socrates, but that's why a lot of people now in the 21st century might say, why are we still listening to the ideas of Plato? Right? Even though he wrote this thing called the Republic and, you know, uh, all of Western civilization is but a footnote to Plato's Republic, etc. He kind of did that because he had a lot of spare time in his life because he could actually just sit under an olive tree and think philosophical thoughts because he had what half a dozen people who actually you know attended to him etc you know um and and a lot of people might think well in in contemporary life uh maybe i'd like to be like plato as well you know have a lot of free time to actually think philosophical thoughts and change the world etc but i can't because i need to work multiple jobs you know to actually pay my rent mortgage etc that kind of thing you know uh, you know, support my family, etc. That kind of thing. You know, so I think that uh, it, it's almost as if you know we have a different kind of slavery in the 21st century. A lot of people are kind of time poor, you know, because maybe uh, we're kind of busy because we are working in order to survive, or we just kind of are artificially busy, and then we don't have time to actually think. Uh, that's just me kind of ranting. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So, so in other words, uh, the the thing about recognizing things that are wrong in society sometimes requires a lot of courage because you might be, uh, you know, one of the few people that can actually see that what everyone is doing is actually wrong. You know. Um, so just, you you join a new organization, very small organization. Let's say it's fifty people. Yeah. Um, and. You join that society, and that um, that organisation has some beliefs. Sure. You actually know that it's wrong. How sure. do you stand up to like fifty, hundred people on your own? You, you, well, I mean, you see, I, 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 in a I mean, you, it's a very difficult thing to do. I, I mean, let me give you an example, right? I mean, uh, 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 Australia. Uh, the uh, defense science and technology organization, right? They had, you know, uh, research organizations here in Melbourne, right? Uh, I think, uh, uh, like the aeronautical research labs in uh, Port Melbourne, and I think uh, in Maribyrnong, they had another research center, but it was actually next to the explosives or munitions factory, right? Where they actually kind of built bombs or, you know, whatever. I don't know what, exactly what they did, right? But I think uh, all of that's been kind of decommissioned. You know, I think I, I went past there a few months ago right, on a tram because I was going to uh, Highport Shopping Centre, right? And it's more like, yeah, wow. So behind the barbed wire fences, etc., there was a munitions factory and, and, a, and a government research centre. But I suppose, and every year, right, they would recruit, uh, you know, science graduates, right, who would get jobs there as experimental scientists and then kind of work hard and publish and then become research scientists, but I suppose, right, their research at Mary Benong may have been involved in, you know, uh, you know, building better bombs, for example, you know, that kind of thing. So in a sense, you know, they were using their knowledge in the sciences to kind of almost design better ways to, you know, hurt people, etc., which might be kind of not right to some people, but some people might think, where am I going to get a job? as a scientist, you know, uh, because it's not like, you know, you have private industry having jobs every week advertised. We need a scientist here. Right? Yet everybody says uh, society needs the sciences, right? Uh, only you need to pay your rent. So sometimes even a science graduate might think, well, you know, I'll just join the, uh, you know, 
government military research you know, institute and you know, just do my work and not kind of worry about the consequences. You know? But then, you know, then if they do think about the long term consequences of what their research is, what it entails, then maybe uh, they change their mind about what they do. Maybe they quit there and, you know, go off and do something else, become a high school teacher or something like that. You know? I don't know. You know? Yeah. Because a lot of times people don't think about the consequences of their actions, which brings me to the next question. I think it's about consequences. Brilliant. Multiple choice. I'm oh, you. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, that's a segue. Because the thing is, like, uh, uh, the uh, thinking about consequences of actions, right, is utilitarianism, right? So, in other words, right, if you're going back to um, assignment one with Beatrice Yang, uh, you know, um, uh, the long-term consequences, right? Uh, she's probably thinking about, right? If, if, if uh, my employer says, okay, I can't use the word master and slave, right, because it's politically incorrect, because GitHub have banned it, right, then then what if the next day they decide to ban something else and something else and something else? And pretty soon, you know, my uh, entire ability to be creative as a coder is completely restricted, you know? Uh, so I think, uh, and, oh, here it is, yeah. Oh, okay, so... Oh, okay, and that, that you can fit in. Utilitarian utilitarianism is an ethical framework where the main thing that matters are one consequences, two sardines, three duties, and four tuna. Or oh, Ilya, is is the plural of tuna tuna or tunas? I don't know. You still there, Ilya? Uh, tuna. No. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, what we should have, right, is an entire session where it's done entirely through multiple choice questions. We have no conversations at all. We just kind of keep talking. I, 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 I keep warning my internet's going all over the place. Uh, uh, yeah, I thought so. I thought so because, you know. It, it's um, because I'm actually connected through my mobile and it was giving me uh, 40, 40, sorry, 42 megabits and now I've dropped down to like three. I, think, I, I, I just had a look, and some of the participants also look like they have spotty internet connections as well. So yeah. it's not just you. Yeah. But I just think uh, it's probably my next door neighbour running around with uh, aluminium foil covered umbrellas. Because uh, I would <laughs> like to say what my theory is. Remember, I talked to you yesterday about him, but I'm not going to say it because this is G-rated, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, He's doing something, which is uh, related to a topic in assignment three. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, I think yeah. Okay, we've got close to a a, a poll. Yes, you're correct. So utilitarianism is an ethical framework where the main thing that matters are consequences, right? So uh, if you want to do a utilitarian analysis about something, you always try to maximise the greater good for the greater number, which is uh, something that happens in the future. In a sense, worrying about the consequences of your actions but in a sense that's kind of one of the criticism always of utilitarianism is how do we know if we're doing things right just to maximize the greater good for the greater number as a consequence that those consequences are actually due to our actions now and not due to luck because sometimes you know we could just be lucky you know and then maybe because of luck we think ah we did the right thing you know what i mean like uh uh, I think uh, if you look at, I don't know if anybody has actually listened to um, Coronavirus Corner, I've got a sound file from last semester, season one, right? And I think I uh, that one may be the one where I talk about the ethicists talking about um, uh, the lack of ventilators in uh, New York hospitals in the first half of the year and how if they were overrun, how do we actually choose who goes on to a ventilator if they're seriously suffering from coronavirus and its complications, right? And I think one of the ethicists basically, basically said there's no kind of one framework where you can kind of justify, you know, making a decision in that kind of extreme situation. That's where your decision has to be entirely random. So basically toss a coin in a sense, you know, if it's kind of really crazy and you can't come up with a rational decision. 
um, which is kind of strange and maybe disconcerting, but you know, um, yeah. But yeah, consequences are the um, important thing about utilitarianism. I think. And duties. Oh, oh, duties. No, I put duties in uh, as a as a, a distractor because duties, remember, is something that's associated with uh, deontology or the Kantian approach to ethical analysis. So duty would be um, what's your your duty as a professional, you know. So, uh, and, and most professions would have you know, clearly articulated duties, you know, uh, and that's how you usually define what a profession is, you know, because you can actually say what the duty of a professional is, it's particularly in medicine and law. Actually, I did put up a, I didn't put up that quote, it was, a, no, I, I'm going to put up another quote, you know. Um, Uh, keep calm and carry on. Uh, now that's that's another kind of I guess uh, a saying, a maxim uh, from uh, you know popular culture, and I think uh, that was very uh, famous during I think World War II. Uh, like they had all these posters, keep calm and carry on, right? And um, it's, I, I think uh, that's another example of a particular ethical framework, which is not one of the big three, because I usually like to think of uh, the big three ethical frameworks as being uh, Kantian ethics, also known as deontology, utilitarianism, and, uh, and Aristotle's virtue ethics, right? And then there are a whole lot of other ways in which people can, you know, uh, live their lives in an ethical manner and keep calm and carry on, I think is an example of, and I'll type in the first letter of the framework. Ah, yes, correct. Yay. Hey, well done. Well done, yes, yes. Keep calm and carry on. It's stoicism, right? So, and, and what's another way of... Uh, Expressing stoicism, you know, you're famous saying that. Shit happens. I <laughs> 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 okay. I think we lost every sec every second letter out of that. It's shit happens. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, so keep calm. So the thing is, like a lot of times, people complain about things. Like, oh no, what can we do, etc. And the stoic approach will be like, yes, we know things are bad, just put up with it. Like, eventually, it'll be better, that kind of thing. Like now, right? So the thing is, what is the stoic approach to dealing with... Um, I'll try it in. What is the... Uh, oh, what is the uh, stoic uh, approach uh, to stage four? But yeah, what is the stoic approach to stage four? And it's like, you know, we're, we're always told what it is, right? You know, like, we're here for the next five more weeks. Uh, we've got to be at home, uh, mainly. We can only go out to exercise for a limited time period. We can only go out to shop for essentials for a limited time period. We've got to make sure that we're, you know, at least 1.5 meters away from people and wear a mask, blah, 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 and not leave, uh, you know, your... Uh, place of residence uh, more than five kilometers away etc uh, you know so and 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 you know uh, realize that we all we are all in it together and eventually you know we'll come out the other end and everything will be a lot better you know and that's stoicism 101 I think you know so yeah keep calm and carry on you know? Can I add to that because I just reconnected I dropped out and reconnected uh, Sorry, there was a um, article on, on which came came across on Twitter I could not find yeah. it again it's uh, yeah. what I mentioned to you a few nights ago was that yeah, new yeah. facial recognition software the add-on yeah. to it now <clears throat> will yeah. have uh, um, an automatic fine sent out to people who are facially recognized not social distancing so the application oh. will do Social distance, take your yeah. photo, send you a bill. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just couldn't, I couldn't find it. 
bloody tweet. I don't know how the kids do it. They they can search through like years of tweets and find things. I, I just can't do it. They, they have they have special search engines for tweets. <laughs> they, they do. They do. You, you have, yeah, yeah, it has facial recognition. It says, "Oh, Ilya's on." Make it really difficult. <laughs> no, I'm just bringing up something. Uh, oh, oh uh, come on. Yes, that's it. Uh, and let me share it now. Uh, as you mentioned social distancing now, and uh, and people may have actually seen this already, uh, but it's it's a dog uh, that they use in Singapore to actually uh, enforce. Uh, oh, that's the one you were talking about. Yes. Yeah, social distancing. Let me see. Um, yeah, there it is. Uh, coronavirus robot dog enforces social distancing in Singapore Park. Robot dogs patrolling one of the Singapore parks as part of coronavirus road trial. The machine is made by US-based Boston Dynamics. It's fitted with a camera to monitor how busy uh, Bishan Ang Mo Park becomes. You were there. You were there in uh, in Singapore. Did you go to that? Well, I was about to say, I, I didn't get a chance to see one of those things. Yeah. <coughs> it also That's carries a loudspeaker to broadcast social distancing messages. See, I think that's a cool idea. I mean, can you imagine? But, you know, why don't we have dogs like that here at RMIT? Because I'm thinking when we go back into the building, right, can you imagine a dog, if it's got a, a loudspeaker, it could just be patrolling around, going up and down the escalators or in lifts, just reminding people about things, you know? <laughs> have you done your assignments, you know? Uh, you know, business they, ethics for a digital they, society is a great course, except for that kind of thing, you know? <laughs> they, they do in Singapore, um, uh, the airport, where the Emporium is, or they call it the em Emerald or whatever, the shopping centre across the road. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people would just sort of drive up and uh, park there to let people out uh, to go to the shopping centre. And they, they've actually got these robots that are about, you know, like um, chest height, and they'll start beeping, like, you know, move, 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 like this, you're not meant to be parking here, and so oh, okay. Okay. So I asked, uh, I asked, uh, do, do they actually give out fines? And the guy says, yeah, they'll actually go around, take a photo of the registration, and uh, you'll get a summons. In interesting. Yeah, yeah. What do you I, yep. I put up the the next next. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. The next thing, the next thing. Uh, and and this would be easy because we just talked about it earlier today. Uh, a social contract is an implicit agreement among the members of a society to cooperate for social benefits. Two, socialism. Three, Facebook. Four, this is boring. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? And and is your I, I, want, I want you to guess who who said socialism. You do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's just uh, that's just name calling, right? Every time you want it. It's socialism. Right? <laughs> feelings, nothing but feelings. <laughs> and I and I'll quickly put the next one up. Straight yeah, up, because yeah, yeah. um, because it's a it's another good one. Um, no, because I think we're running out of time. You're right? running and out of time. And I think this is how we know that we're running out of time when your in internet starts going to pot. It's like the internet say, "Time to get off the <laughs> road." There are other people that want to watch Netflix. <laughs> what? <Watch, watch. laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the answer is number one. So a social contract yeah. is an implicit agreement among the members of, of society to cooperate for social benefit. So uh, yeah. in, 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 in assignment one, do you think that there's a social contract with the workplace, right? Probably not, right? I think maybe, uh, you know, uh, it, it's more like, you know, you're in the workplace and you have to do certain things, right? Because there's a code of conduct and maybe expectations of your employer. Um, you know, uh, uh, maybe there could be like uh, another kind of implicit agreement between another association of people that Beatrice Yang is, you know, um, you know, talking with, perhaps, I guess. But, you know, I would think maybe, you know, I wouldn't use social contract with the Beatrice Yang scenario. Maybe you bring up the other one. Yep, I'm just typing it in. Because, because the other thing that you should look at, uh, student audience, right, is uh, the list of virtues. Uh, which you can find in uh, the week two and three uh, learning materials folder. 
and uh, it'll give you what Aristotle's original uh, virtues were, and then a huge list of a bunch of other ones, right? And basically, what a virtue is is uh, you know a, a, an attribute that a person has that is a positive character trait, because uh, virtue ethics is character based, you know. And oh, sorry. And I gave the answer away. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Anyway, virtue ethics is a framework that is. One. Everyone here. <laughs> <is getting better. laughs> well, people still get the wrong answer. It's <laughs> a framework that is one consequence based no. two duty based no. is three is a D based. What is D based <laughs> mean? Debased. <laughs> yeah, no more databases. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but, but, but um, if, you're, if, if you're yeah. going to have an exam, uh, yeah. everyone will be listening to you <laughs> and uh, picking the right choices. <laughs> uh, good one. And, and what yeah. was so, so character based? So character based basically means uh, you become. Uh, you know, whatever uh, good quality you want to be, like cor uh, courage, you know, so you kind of look at examples of people like <laughs> courageous. And, <laughs> and, 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 and what's the last one? Is a true or false one? Is it? I think it's a true or yeah, false one. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a bit, just a bit. But... Yeah, yeah, and, and actually probably I just gave away the answer now, you know, as to what that is. But um, anyhow, uh, if, oh, okay, Aristotle famous is you are what you repeatedly do. Yes or no? Is it, is it true or not? Oh, yeah, yeah. Everyone's doing a Google search really quickly. Oh. <laughs> Somebody's confident. Yeah. 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 You go very quick, quick Google search. He may not have said exactly that, right? You have to it's like, <laughs> it's like approximately. You probably said it in ancient Greek, you know, etc. You know. And then, now we'll do the virtue thing, and we'll uh, not the virtue, but we'll do the social contract thing. And say, oh, three voted for that. I'll do the same. <laughs> <laughs> but I see, I see here that people are, you know, you know in agreement. It's, we have a quorum, you know. So yes, the answer is yes. You are what you repeatedly do. So in other words, I, I like the fact that someone's gone against. Yes. <laughs> The rebel, you know, like, yeah, good, you know. good. Uh, so I thought it was Plato. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting. Uh, one day I want to do like a like a mini series or a movie for Netflix, right? Like yeah. Aristotle versus Plato, right? Because I, I think they had a falling out, you know. But I think it'd be great, you know, because I think Netflix is kind of hungry for content, right? Because they all sound the same, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you gotta understand, like, it must have been a cool time, right, in life. You just go down to the agora, right, and there's nothing but philosophers, right? What do you believe in? What do you believe in, etc. Oh, Ilya, uh, before we actually quit, you know, who's that uh, health minister? Uh, Jenny McCarkos? Ah, uh, yes. Remember what Jenny McCarkos, uh, uh, last weekend, she tweeted something about, uh, you know, that. Um, uh, Royal Commission or whatever inquiry is the yep. hotel uh, scandal, right? And yep. uh, and then she was kind of apologizing on Twitter, but she actually quoted one of her heroes uh, from ancient Greek history, Pericles. Pericles, oh. right? And, uh, and, and everybody was talking about that. Um, let me bring that up. Uh, because uh, they were saying, why is, she, why is she quoting Pericles, right? Um, and then people were looking at the Wikipedia article for Pericles and kind of uh, making all kinds of comments, but I'm just bringing up... Uh, uh, oh, I'm getting it here. Here you go. You're getting it. Okay, you're getting it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yep. That's Pericles. Okay, yeah. But the thing is, um, uh, uh, so he was in charge of Athens, I think, right? But apparently, I... I, I, I did some digging, and they actually had a plague in Athens, like the Great Plague of, of Athens. Right? Uh -huh. uh, can do a, who said it? Quit. Oh, who said it? Oh yeah, okay, we can do. Yep. So I don't want to talk. <laughs> oh wow! Cardiac. 
I've got to get that link quick before it disappears. Yeah, quick, quick, get that link. We'll put it up, right? But, but Kanye, right? He's a very interesting person. And like, uh, there, there are people that kind of uh, liken him to uh, like a great romantic uh, poet from the uh, uh, 19th century, right? But yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, what is well, what's start? Okay, my my fingers are long. My <laughs> <laughs> oh, fingers are long and beautiful. A very and beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> right, Okay, what what what? Okay. Uh, well, he's gonna he's gonna vote for it. Okay, what, what's the answer? Um, how do you actually? Do you have to do the whole yeah, thing? Or just hint, right? Hint. Okay, hint, 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 hint. Press hint. What is that? We've eliminated that. Uh, so which one do we pick? Trump. Trump. We'll go Trump. Trump. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, <laughs> <see. laughs> he Okay, the next one. Next one. What's it? Both sides and inside and out. If I fully understand why. Trump. 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 <laughs> yeah. Next one. That's it. I'm voting for him. <laughs> okay, Trump. Trump. <laughs> Trump. Yeah. They don't care if he's too soon. Oh, I don't know about that. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So. Yeah. It's a... <laughs> See, I, I'm just being a bad student, remember? Just picking the same thing all the time. A, 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 A. Yeah. You know, it's really better media, right? You don't know Big D, right? Oh, that's Trump. That's Trump. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> that's a good one. Thanks, Connor. It's oh, uh, fantastic. This is fantastic. Thanks, Connor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. We can't have too much fun. What were we talking about? Oh, yeah. Oh, you're talking about Jenny McCarkos. Jenny McCarkos, right? Uh, you know, talks about Pericles, right? And everybody's debating Pericles, right? And even people like Randy, Tom, Tom Elliott saying, yeah, I studied Pericles when I did one subject at uni, et cetera, that kind of thing. It's amazing, right? You know? And then I, I looked up some stuff, right? And apparently there was a plague in Athens around about the time of Pericles, right? Uh, and, and Pericles died from the plague, which is kind of ironic. So it's like, you know, Jim Mikarkos, his hero is Pericles, who died in a plague, and we're kind of in a plague now, you know, a pandemic, etc. But but I, I I found that there was a historian that wrote a book on the Great Plague of uh, Athens, right? And he was uh, uh, saying that it came at a time in Athenian history that oh, you're bragging? No, I'm just checking. No, no, it's okay. Go go ahead, go ahead. And 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 basically he said, well, the the, the plague actually may have changed the course of history you know because it actually kind of made things it, it had an influence not just on people's health at the time in Athens right but also on the way uh, Athenian culture actually unfolded you know uh, which was kind of fascinating which kind of also makes me think maybe the same thing is happening now in the world you know with the coronavirus because now we're kind of in a similar situation even more so than the plague of Athens because that was just an Athens Whereas coronavirus is actually affecting the whole world, right? And now since we're extremely connected, you know, so what is this? Sorry, uh, that, that's that phone a friend. That, uh, that's phone a friend. Somebody's actually yeah. saying it's time to go, right? Or maybe it's a Domino's. Is that Domino's, right? They're saying, what do you want on your pizza? Uh, so, I was about to say my, my internet's gone down again. Oh, to zero. That's very okay. good. Okay. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. It's, oh, 13? No, see, it's, it's gone back up to 13, but I've got red buzz. I don't understand why. Yeah, I've actually got 30, and I'm on red buzz. You're making me envious. Now I'm going to have to pull out my own uh, internet speed test, and we'll try and have a look. <laughs> Who's got the fastest internet, right? And then we'll do something else. We'll try and, you know, compare pulse rates. How about that, you know? Pulse rates, weight, <laughs> etc. But, but seriously, why, why do I have red bars? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. Uh, See, what would Socrates say, say, right? A life unexamined <laughs> is not worth living, right? You're asking an existential question. Why do I have red bars, right? Yeah, you know, it's a mystery, happens. right? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyway, yes. All right.
you know, you know, you know something. You, 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 you know what I'm going to do, right? Uh, as soon as you know, yeah. I'm allowed to walk around like a human being. I'm going to kind of try and get some kind of device, like a button. And, and every time you're in trouble, you just hit the button, and there's a your voice that says shit happens, right? That kind of, you know what I mean? Like a stoicism button. That kind of thing, right? That, that way it's a reminder. You know, shit happens, that kind of thing. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. I missed there out on toilet paper. paper, hit the button, shit happens. That kind of thing. Wrap up time, right? Wrap up time, okay, yes. Uh, is there one more question? No, there's, there's no more questions. Okay. So, wrap up. Okay. Do, do you have any um, advice? To give our student audience right about uh, assignment one since we kind of talked about utilitarianism and how uh you know Kantian ethics can be applicable and maybe not so much social contract anything from your you very very simply make sure that you actually reference what you're talking about within the text and in within the text make sure that you actually cover at least two or three um ethical frameworks Yep, and uh, I'm I'm really super interested to hear uh, the the personal uh, yeah. side of it and be really open and don't 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 shut it down and think oh you're part of a social contract right now forget that right <clears throat> really want to see what you actually think right? you're not going to offend anyone even if you use the f word I don't care because <laughs> I, I think what Ilya is trying to say is he wants to find out how you actually feel yourselves yeah. about that political correctness movement that is even yeah. actually influencing how people code software. You know, yeah. people are saying, you can't use the words master and slave, right? Uh, because, you know, it will offend some people, right? That's an important thing that you should think about, you know? And some people might feel the same as Beatrice Yang. Why should I do this? You know, I mean, they're just words, you know? And, and here's, here's a really great thing, right, is um, uh, out on the streets, you have to watch what you say, what you do, how you dress, all that sort of stuff. In this course, who cares, right? You, you, <laughs> are, you are completely free, right? You, so step out of the boundary. Actually step out and actually start yelling and screaming. Great. Well, within limits, I think, you know. <laughs> I really don't care. <laughs> so, so, so you're you're actually hoping for the day when somebody just gives you an assignment full of profanity. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm really looking to to see um, someone who's really open and says, "Hey, this is what I believe in." I'm going to stand up in a crowd. I don't care if it's two thousand people. I'm going to say what I want to say when I want to say. That's that's what I really like to see, because I, I, majority of times you always see someone just trying to. You know, slot in and be one of the sheep. You know that sort of thing. And I, I used to get that on at, at the interviews all the time. And the guys who really stood out were the guys who, no, I disagree with it. And they actually were strong enough to say no within an interview, right? And even even stronger, I don't know within an interview. It's just awesome stuff. Yeah. Wow, I don't know. And that's actually, yeah. you know, oh, big time. Uh, uh, it, yeah, because I mean, for a person to actually say that, you know, you have to uh, people usually try to fit in and not stand out. Ah, yes, okay, yeah, um, which is yeah. But I think the thing is, right, in life uh, now, especially, you know, the situation that we're in, and when we do, when when the world goes back to normal, right, uh, I think it's not just going to be about fitting. In. Oh, oh, yeah, fitting. I, yeah, yeah because you try to not stand it exactly, but you, you, yeah. you have to be you have to be you, right? Uh, people say the three hardest words to say. Oh, I don't know who exactly, and it's, and it's it's even harder in an interview. It really is, right? But when you actually step over the bounds, here's your chance in this course, right? When you step out of that boundary, it, you become more powerful. You really do. Well, I mean, I mean, maybe the important thing is if you do say something like "I don't know," you should probably try to articulate why you don't know. You know, that's the important yeah. thing. Oh, exactly. You, just, you would say, just, "I don't know." Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And, you know, can you help me understand? Or I am, I have the ability to go and find out quickly and yeah. you know, efficient and so forth. Right? Yeah. But, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, to actually say, like like uh, Connor and uh, Dipit said, uh, if you if you can step out of the bound. 
you actually become a better person. You really do. Yeah, well, uh, and, and I think uh, kind of stepping out of that bound, as you say earlier, requires a little bit of courage, which is actually kind of another Aristotelian virtue, you know, and, and maybe a lot of people, you know, are afraid in life. And I think fear is something that actually holds us back, I think, which is a bad thing. Well, that's, that's why I'll, I'll go back uh, to what we were discussing before. I said, if you were a person who came from another organization, came into an organization and you knew they were definitely doing something wrong, yeah. how do you go about, you know, uh, changing them or how does the organization go about changing you? Right? And it, it takes a lot to come out and actually say, Hey, you guys are really doing something wrong, right? And you're there on your own, right? Like you're a oh, yep. man, yeah. And it's, it's a powerful thing to actually take the first, and the first step is that I don't know. It's yep. really easy to say, but to actually do it, oh, man. Yeah, yeah. But but don't kind of just you know have a kind of clue <laughs> being I don't know repeated until the two thousand word limit. <laughs> you actually got to. Maybe say, I don't know, and something else. I don't know with references, maybe. Yeah. But, but if, you, if, you, if you do say, I don't know, right, um, it, like, why don't they get in touch with you and it be discuss things? Right? Uh, you actually see, like in this course, a lot of lot of students in the past never asked a question. And then once they, um, once they actually put pen to paper, then they start asking questions after they get their feedback. Right? Yeah. Be, be, yeah. Before, not after. Yeah. Yeah, what, what was the old adage? You know, the, the horse is bolted before the car and all that rubbish. Yeah. So just just keep on asking questions, I think, you know. Yeah, uh, yes, exactly. That's the best thing you could do, I think, you know. Yeah. And, uh, it's not a philosophy course, it's, a, it's an open mind course. Yeah. And, and, and here's another question to you, Ilya. Is it time for us to yes. wind up? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely, because we were supposed to about 10 minutes ago. Okay, <laughs> but I, yeah, I'm having okay. Time like like Connor the people, they they all sort of like uh, had some really good laughs especially that oh. um, I'm gonna go to that website and I answer all the questions. <laughs> the the um, Kanye versus Trump thing. Okay, yes. yeah, oh, yes, maybe, yes. Maybe maybe I'll have to no. actually put that link up on uh, on Microsoft Teams in the digital. I'm gonna get my to do it. <laughs> actually, actually, you post. Actually, somebody post okay. that. Now, see the thing is, guys, I want you to actually start posting things that are actually interesting into the it's digital awesome. ethics club, right? So even even stuff like, you know, kind of with you and the Trump versus, um, you know, Kanye thing, Fun stuff, stuff like that, that into uh, into the digital ethics club. Why? Because when you think about it, right, right versus wrong, two opposing sides, Kanye versus Trump, you know? Yeah. Uh, is one right and the other wrong? Or are they both eh? <laughs> Who knows? Uh, I think it's time to wind up because Ilya will go entirely red bar eventually. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. Uh, again, it was really good uh, seeing all the guys here. Okay. But, so, it's good afternoon from me and good yeah. afternoon, Ilya. And uh, from, from see you next time, students. See you. Bye.